So this time we're going to talk about everything in chapter 10. We're going to talk about heredity and genes, somatic cells and gametes, reproduction, autosomes, sex chromosomes, homologs, diploid and haploid cells, uh, sexual life cycles, um, and then we'll go over uh, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, um, synapsis, crossing over, and then how mitosis and meiosis are different. Then we'll talk about sources of um, variation and kind of how genetic variation and evolution go together, but we'll talk much more about evolution in uh, Unit 5. So if you remember in Unit 1, we said that, um, you know, a characteristic of life is reproduction. Um, so obviously living things have to be able to reproduce. Heredity is the transmission of traits from one generation to the next. And then obviously all organisms, even of the same species, are not the same. There's some variation there. So there's differences in appearance um, that offspring are going to show from their parents and also from their siblings. And then genes are the basic unit of heredity and they're made up of segments of DNA. And each gene has a specific position or a locus or a lo loci um, on a certain chromosome. And then gametes can transmit genes from one generation to the next in plants and animals. So we've got sperm and egg for that. So as far as reproduction goes, reproduction could either be asexual or sexual. Asexual reproduction is when an individual passes genes to its offspring without the fusion of gametes, so they use mitosis. Um, this produces a clone, which is a group of genetically identical individuals from the same parent. And then with sexual reproduction, that's when you have two parents that give rise to offspring that have unique combinations of genes that are inherited from those parents. This requires meiosis and this contributes to genetic variation. All right, so let's review. The first question says, label the examples as either sexual or asexual reproduction. Um, and in the first example, we've got a unicellular organism splitting into two cells and then those two cells splitting into four cells. So in this case, that's going to be asexual reproduction. While some unicellular organisms can do sexual reproduction, um, this is just one cell going into two. Um, so this is asexual. In the next example in the first question we've got um, human reproduction so there's a male and a female and sperm and egg and the sperm and egg fuse and make a zygote which grows up to an embryo which grows up to the baby which eventually will grow up um, from there and so this is going to be sexual reproduction. The last example is kind of a tricky one. We've got a sweet potato plant and they're really not showing you what is happening with this sweet potato. Um, so with this plant, if you took the potato and put it in the ground, um, you would get another sweet potato plant. Um, but the potato isn't a seed, so you have to know a little bit about plant biology to know what's happening in this one. Um, but if you take like a cutting of a plant, you can, you know, depending on the species, you can put that cutting in water and get roots and get a whole new plant, um, and it's a clone. So in this case, uh, the sweet potato is going to be asexual reproduction. It's not that plants can't do sexual reproduction, they absolutely can, but um, when we reproduce a plant with like a cutting or a fragment of the plant, um, that is asexual reproduction. Number two says, give an example of a human somatic cell, is this haploid or diploid? Um, a human somatic cell is like your regular body cell, so like a liver cell or a skin cell or a bone cell or you know a photoreceptor in your eye those would all be somatic cells and in humans their body cells are going to be or our body cells rather right are going to be diploid number three then says give an example of a human gamete um, and it says is this cell haploid or diploid so human gametes are sperm or egg and they are going to be haploid So there's different sexual life cycles. Um, a life cycle is just the generation to generation sequence of stages in the reproductive history of an organism. There's three big life cycles we'll talk about. Um, the diploid life cycle, which is what you're probably familiar with. Um, then alternation of generations in plants and some algae. And then the haploid life cycle, which is in fungi and some protist. So life cycles, um, or sorry, sexual life cycles require fertilization, which is the fusion of gametes, and then mitosis, which produces identical cells for growth and repair. So mitosis can go from diploid to diploid, or it can go from haploid to haploid, but we're keeping the chromosome number the same there. Um, 
And then meiosis is going to half the chromosome number and produce genetically different cells. So that goes from diploid to haploid. It doesn't go from haploid to anything else because I don't know what that would be, like quadruploid or something. That doesn't exist. So it's going from diploid to haploid. Um, and meiosis is important because it maintains the chromosome number from one generation to the next generation. So if we look at the diploid life cycle, um, this is the animal life cycle for the most part. And um, in this, you've got fertilization, which is the uni union of those haploid gametes. So the sperm and egg get together and they produce a diploid zygote. Um, and then that zygote divides by mitosis and produces the different cells of that organism's body and that develops into an adult. And then there's germline tissue that's diploid. Um, so this is specific tissue, um, let's say in the ovaries and the testes, and that's going to produce haploid gametes by way of meiosis. So like I said, the diploid life cycle is probably something you're already familiar with because it's the life cycle that humans have. Um, so our somatic cells, again, are diploid and have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We have 22 pairs of autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes, which are X and Y in humans. And then our gametes are sperm or egg and they're haploid um, and they have 23 chromosomes. So the egg, um, always has an X chromosome, and then the sperm has either an X or a Y. Um, later on, we'll talk about things that can go um, a little bit differently in meiosis and how um, maybe you could have a different chromosome number there. But typically, um, a gamete should have 23 chromosomes, um, and one of them is a sex chromosome. So. Plants have kind of a weird life cycle. I hate to call it weird, but it's very different than our life cycle. Um, they have two multicellular stages. Um, the diploid multicellular form is called the sporophyte, um, and then the haploid multicellular form is called the gametophyte. So the diploid sporophyte produces haploid spores. So to go from diploid to haploid, you have to do meiosis. So they do meiosis, and then that haploid spore grows up to become the multicellular haploid gametophyte, and that gametophyte produces haploid gametes, and to go from haploid to haploid, they use mitosis. So then there's fungi, and they've got another kind of unique life cycle. They've got a haploid life cycle where um, they have, like, their majority of their body tissue is haploid, um, but they have a diploid zygote if they're doing sexual reproduction. So um, the zygote is the only diploid stage. There's no multicellular diploid stage. And then the zygote produces haploid cells by meiosis, and those haploid cells grow by mitosis into that haploid multicellular organism. And then the haploid adults produce gametes by mitosis since they're already haploid cells. So go ahead and um, maybe pause it and look at this and try and label the life cycles. So in the first picture, the purple picture, we've got multicellular haploid stage and a multicellular diploid stage. So that's going to be alternation of generations. In the second picture, the, I don't know, orangey, reddy picture, um, we've got most of the organism is haploid. Right, that's what the big N stands for, and only the zygote is diploid. So that's going to be haploid. And then in the other one, you've got um, most of the organism is diploid, except you've got a small part that's haploid. So that one's going to be haploid. So it goes alternation and generations, um, haploid, and then diploid. So let's talk about what meiosis is. Um, again, but it reduces the chromosome number from diploid to haploid. It produces four genetically different cells. There's two rounds of nuclear division to do this. Um, we call those meiosis one and meiosis two. And it involves pairing of homologous chromosomes. Um, and remember, homologous chromosomes are chromosomes that carry genes that control the same inherited characteristics. Um, and each pair of homologs um, includes one chromosome that came from each parent originally. All right, so the first question is provide an example of homologous chromosomes from this karyotype. Um, so remember the karyotype is a picture of um, the chromosomes from an individual and the chromosomes are sorted out and paired up. So the homologous chromosomes would be like the two chromosome ones or the two chromosome twos or the true chromosome 15s. And then before meiosis can occur, the chromosomes have to be duplicated. What phase of the cell cycle does this happen in? 
So last unit, we talked about mitosis and the eukaryotic cell cycle. Um, so when did the chromosomes replicate then? It wasn't actually in mitosis, it was in interphase. And then do you remember what phase of interphase? So it's S phase of interphase that the chromosomes replicate in. So they replicate in S phase of interphase before meiosis as well. So here's an overview of meiosis. Um, you've got meiosis one and meiosis two. And then meiosis one includes prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one and cytokinesis. Does that seem familiar at all? Um, probably, right? So mitosis, you've got prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokinesis. In meiosis, you have to make sure to put the Roman numerals so that indicates that it's actually meiosis and not mitosis. So then the second phase of meiosis includes prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase 2, or telophase 2, and cytokinesis. So we're going to walk through each of those coming up here. So if we start with prophase 1, um, just like in prophase of mitosis, the chromosomes condense, the nuclear envelope dissolves, um, but now we have synapsis of homologous chromosomes. Remember homologous chromosomes were like the two chromosome ones. So the chromosome ones are getting together and they align gene by gene and the zipper-like structure called the synaptomial complex is going to form. Um, and then prophase one can also have an event called crossing over occur where non-sister chromatids exchange DNA segments and they form this X-shaped um, chasmata and that shows where crossing over has occurred. So you can see that in the picture over on the right there. So crossing over produces recombinant chromosomes. If we look at the word recombinant, like recombined. So it recombines DNA. Um, so you get a combination of traits um, that neither original parent had. Um, and in humans, one to three crossover events occur per chromosome pair. And it's exciting. <laughs> I always say things are exciting, but it's exciting because you get these new combinations um, of maternal and paternal alleles. So after prophase one comes metaphase one. In metaphase one, the homologous pairs line up at the metaphase plate um, and they do so randomly. You can see below the different possible arrangements. Um, if you think of the red chromosomes indicating chromosomes that came from, let's say, the mother originally and the blue ones came from the father originally, um, you can see the different combinations of um, chromosomes we can get. So this random assortment is called independent assortment. Um, and then microtubules are going to attach to the kinetochores of um, one of the chromosomes on either side of the tetrad. So um, eventually after metaphase comes anaphase and they're going to separate in anaphase one. So in anaphase one, um, pairs of homologous chromosomes are going to separate. So one chromosome is going to move towards each pole and it's going to be guided by the spindle apparatus. And um, in anaphase of mitosis, the sister chromatids are separated, but in anaphase one of meiosis, the sister chromatids stay attached um, at the centromere and they move as a unit towards the pole. So in the beginning of telophase one, each half of the cell has a haploid set of chromosomes. Um, this is a little bit tricky, but we pulled our homologs apart. So we still have um, the sister chromatids to make up each chromosome, but the cell is technically haploid at this point. I really wouldn't ask, um, or you know, the new cells that are gonna be produced are gonna be haploid. I really wouldn't ask a question on this because I think this is kind of easy to confuse because you've got the sister chromatids still attached. Um, so here's a picture of meiosis one again. The kind of key point of meiosis one is that it's separating the homologous chromosomes and this is when we technically would go from diploid to haploid. And again, when you're, you know, looking at the exam, it's important to realize that prophase one is different than prophase and prophase one is also different than prophase two. So watch out for those Roman numerals, they will catch you. So prophase two is a lot like um, prophase of mitosis, really. You've got the nuclear envelope dissolving, the spindle, spindle apparatus is going to form. Um, the chromosomes at this point are still composed of the two sister chromatids. They're gonna move their way towards the metaphase plate. 
in metaphase two, the sister chromatids are going to be arranged at the metaphase, metaphase plate, um, and the two sister chromatids of each chromosome are not going to be genetically identical anymore. Do you know why that would be? So it's something that happens in prophase one. So in prophase one, there's crossing over that occurs. Remember, crossing over is when non-sister chromosomes, um, or sorry, non-sister chromatids exchange genetic material. Um, so it forms recombinant chromosomes. So that's why they wouldn't be the same anymore. Um, so that brings us to anaphase two. Um, in anaphase two, the sister chromatids separate. Remember in anaphase one, the homologous chromosomes separate and the sister chromatids were still attached. But finally, in anaphase two, the sister chromatids are going to separate. And then the sister chromatids of each chromosome now move um, as two newly individual chromosomes towards the opposite poles. Then telophase two in cytokinesis, um, it's basically we're cleaning up the cell, so we get nucleotidiform, the chromosomes begin to decondense or relax, and um, at the end of cytokinesis, we get four haploid daughter cells that are genetically different from each other and also from the parent cell because we had um, crossing over occur and um, independent assortment of homologs. So here's meiosis two. Really kind of the big deal here is that we're separating the sister chromatids. So again, you've got prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase and cytokinesis where you get four um, haploid daughter cells at the end that are genetically different. So sometimes students get confused and they tell me that, you know, meiosis is just mitosis twice because it produces four cells or something like that. I'm not really sure. But um, there are some events that are unique to meiosis. Again, we've got synapsis and crossing over in prophase one. Remember, synapsis is when the homologous chromosomes get together. Um, and then crossing over is when our homologous chromosomes are going to exchange genetic information and form recombinant chromosomes. Um, also, the alignment of homologous pairs at the metaphase plate is another event that's unique to meiosis. Um, the homologs are going to um, pair up randomly, like it's not just one side is where all the chromosomes that came from dad and the other side is where all the chromosomes that came from mom line up. They just can do that independent, independently. Um, and then separating those homologs during anaphase one is another event that is unique to meiosis. So again, mitosis and meiosis are not the same thing. Meiosis is not just mitosis twice. Um, as far as DNA replication goes, both of them have DNA replication before they begin, during interphase and during S phase of interphase in particular. Um, mitosis has one round of nuclear divisions, um, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then meiosis has two rounds, prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, and then the whole thing again. Um, in mitosis, synapsis of homologous chromosomes does not occur. However, it does occur in meiosis in prophase one, and that's when crossing over can happen between non-sister chromatids. Um, and then mitosis produces two genetically identical cells. Meiosis produces um, four genetically different cells. Mitosis can go from diploid to diploid or haploid to haploid, depending on the type of critter and its life cycle. And meiosis goes from diploid to haploid. So meiosis is like a reduction division. So as far as mitosis in an animal or plant body, um, it enables the multicellular animal or plant um, to arise from a single cell. It produces cells for growth, repair, um, and sometimes for asexual reproduction, depending on the kind of critter. And um, in organisms that have a haploid multicellular stage, um, haploid gametes can be produced from haploid cells. Um, Meiosis in animals produces gametes um, or spores in the spore fight plant generation, and it reduces the number of chromosome sets by half and introduces genetic variability among the gametes or spores. So meiosis is really important for sexual reproduction to, uh, to maintain the chromosome number from one generation to the next. So sexual reproduction produces genetic variation in a way or encourages genetic variation, but really a mutation is the ultimate source of genetic variation. So mutation is just a change in a DNA sequence. If we have different versions of a gene, we call those alleles. Um, 
And we'll talk more about that coming up in the next couple of chapters in this unit. Um, but during sexual reproduction, the shuffles existing mutations or existing alleles around. Um, this happens in independent assortment of chromosomes, which happens in um, metaphase one of meiosis one. Um, so as far as the possible combinations that can occur, um, mathematically, it would be two to the nth power. And for humans, um, since we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, um, our n would be 23. So two to the 23rd power would be 8,388,608 combinations. So that's a ton of combinations. Um, and that's just like the way your chromosomes could assort in producing either a single sperm or single egg. So that's a lot of variation. And that doesn't even take into account com uh, cross crossing over. So crossing over creates recombinant chromosomes that we're not seeing in either parent. Um, and then we can have random fertilization, which is basically saying the collection of genes within a gamete doesn't give that gamete any better chance of fusing with another gamete to produce a zygote. And not all species truly have random fertilization. Sometimes some sperm are more likely to fertilize the egg than others. Um, but that's a little bit more complicated than we're, we're going to get into at this point. Um, but if you're interested, um, you can look up and find out about non-random fertilization. So evolution and genetic variation go together. Evolution is just a change in a population's genetics, and we will talk about that more in Unit 5. So if this little tiny bit on evolution and genetic variation doesn't solve everything or clarify everything, I promise we'll get to it later. Um, but a population changes through differential reproductive success of its members, or at least that's one way it can change. Um, so if we look at this cheesy diagram over here to the right, um, we've got a selection of crows and beetles, and the crows have an easier time finding the green beetles, or they find them tastier, or whatever. And so, over time, the green beetles are selected against, and the brown beetles are selected for. Um, so, brown beetles are more likely to have offspring that are brown and offspring that would survive. So, over time, we're going to have more brown beetles in this population of beetles. So um, that's an example of natural selection. So natural selection results in the accumulation of genetic variations that are favored by the particular environment or selected for by that particular environment. Um, so like I said, we'll talk more about evolution later, but it's important when we think about, you know, genetic variation and recombinant chromosomes and combining traits in different ways and kind of the whole point of sexual reproduction is to combine traits in different ways. So there's some costs and benefits to sexual reproduction. Um, it may break favorable genetic combinations. For example, if we had a group of alleles that were really well suited to a particular environment and then we shuffled them back up, um, the offspring might not have those alleles and then the offspring might not be as suited to that particular environment and the offspring might not live. Um, the mating process itself can be costly. You know, searching for a mate takes time and energy. Um, it can increase the risks of predation and parasite transmission. Um, and producing gametes can be costly as well. Um, and even just having males in a species um, can be costly as well. Um, and benefits of sexual reproduction um, is that we get these new combination of traits that allow a population to adapt to a changing environment. So the environment doesn't make the organisms adapt, but if we have a good mix of traits that match the environment at that time or are well suited to the environment at that time, then those organisms with that combination of traits are more likely to survive and reproduce in that particular environment. All right, so compare and contrast prophase, prophase one, and prophase two. Go ahead and pause it and think about your answer, and when you're ready, restart it. All right, so remember prophase is part of mitosis, and prophase one and prophase two are part of meiosis. Um, and then if we think about prophase of mitosis, at the start of prophase, um, the cell could either be diploid or haploid, depending on what kind of organism it is and what part of the life cycle it's in. Um, prophase 1 of meiosis always has to be diploid at the start, and prophase 2 of meiosis is going to be haploid at the start. Um, and then from there, prophase 1 has some unique things that don't happen in either prophase of mitosis or prophase 2. 
Um, in prophase one, the homologous chromosomes get together, so we call that synapsis of homologous chromosomes. And then because those homologous chromosomes are together, we can have crossing over of non-sister chromatids occurring. Um, that does not happen in prophase of mitosis or prophase two. Um, so those are the big things I thought of. If you thought of something different and you're concerned about it, feel free to ask me. So that was chapter 10. We talked about meiosis and sexual life cycles. So we talked about heredity and genes um, and somatic cells versus gametes. So somatic cells are body cells, gametes are like sex cells. Um, we talked about reproduction like super briefly. We talked about autosomes um, and sex chromosomes. So sex chromosomes are part of sex determining systems um, and autosomes are just your kind of regular other chromosomes. So humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so 22 autosomes and one pair of sex chromosomes. Um, we talked about homologous chromosomes, so like your two chromosome ones, your two chromosome twos, so on and so forth. Um, diploid and haploid, so diploid is two sets of chromosomes, haploid is one set of chromosomes. We talked about the sexual life cycles, which are alternation of generations in plants, um, the diploid life cycle in most animals, and then haploid life cycle in uh, fungi and some protists. Then we went over the stages of meiosis, so um, prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, um, and then prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, um, telophase two, cytokinesis. Um, we talked about some special events in meiosis, so synapses of homologous chromosomes, crossing over of non-sister chromatids, um, and then we compared mitosis and meiosis. And then we talked about the sources of variation, so independent assortment of chromosomes in metaphase one, um, recombinant chromosomes formed through crossing over, and then random fertilization, um, where any sperm could fertilize any egg of that particular species or the chances of that. And then we talked about how genetic variation can contribute to evolution and kind of like why organisms would do sexual reproduction if it's so costly and so kind of involved. Um, so that is chapter 10.